Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll get started here in about another minute or so once we get a few more folks dialed in. Good morning, everyone. We'll give about one more minute uh, as folks are still dialing in here, and then we'll kick off the webinar. Good morning and thank you for joining us. We'll give about another 30 seconds. I can still see a few, a few folks queuing in to, to get going here and we'll kick off here shortly. All right. Well, good morning everyone and thank you for joining us. On behalf of Inveris, Moss Adams, Haynes and Boone, Netherlands Sewell, and Entercom, we welcome you, to, welcome you to this panel discussion on what we're seeing the rest of this year kind of play out and some of the trends we've seen leading up to this point. My name is Aaron Vandeford. I'm president of Entercom and will be your moderator for the discussion today. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, all attendees will enter in listen-only mode. We'll have time for Q&A in the, in the, uh, after some prepared remarks from each of our presenters and panelists. Uh, to submit a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A tool and presenters will answer uh, questions. I expect a lively discussion with this bunch. Uh, you may see a polling question pop up during the presentation. Those will be up for about 45 seconds, then we'll display responses on those. Uh, should anyone have any technical issues, please email events at inveris.com and we'll get you all taken care of. So jumping in, I'm happy to be joined by Bernadette Johnson, uh, Vice President of Strategic Analysis at Inveris. She will be first to present. We'll be followed by er Eric Stevens, uh, Senior Vice President at Nellan Sewell. He'll discuss uh, the current price and its impact on reserves. Next will be Jeff Nichols, partner and co-chair of the Energy Practice with Haynes and Boone. He'll discuss business issues and legal issues uh, affecting the oil and gas market. And last will be Joe Bleiss, uh, who will take a look at the accounting issues affecting uh, commodity or companies today. And then we'll jump into uh, Q&A. So with that, I would like to turn the call over to Bernadette Johnson to discuss a little bit on uh, market fundamentals. Take it away, Bernadette. All right, perfect. So if we'll go to the next slide, we'll start with the fundamentals piece. I've got about eight slides for you. We're gonna keep remarks to about seven, eight minutes, and then definitely we'll have questions as was mentioned. So um, save those questions and we'll definitely get to them. So if we start out with the market, so my role at Inveris is I lead a team and our primary mandate is forward looking views of the market. What happens with oil prices? What happens with gas prices and why? So we're tracking fundamentals. We're looking at supply, demand, things like price wars, demand destruction, OPEC cuts and compliance levels, infrastructure. We're looking at all those pieces and really we use those things to pull together our view of what happens next. And so that's what I'm gonna walk through some of that with y'all. This is the first, uh, the first slide here is global supply and demand. So this is the 100 million barrel a day market that you hear about. So this data is coming from IEA. And what I, what I have here is history. The dark line 
on the top is supply, the green line is demand. You can see the difference between the two is those bars. So anytime that bar is above the axis, it means the market is oversupplied. And anytime it's under, it means the market is undersupplied. And so that obviously has, has pretty significant price ramifications. So this is what drives prices, right? So if we look at those bars, if you look at Q1 of 2020, right there in the middle, those, that tall bar, and Q2, the tallest, we were very oversupplied in Q2, right? And so we, we lived that, we know that. Price war, demand destruction, OPEC production at very high levels. Um, it was a very chaotic time. And what you basically saw was demand fell off a cliff. We had too much supply. We had operators forced with shutting in production. We had a dramatic lay down in the recount. And then we started towards the end of Q2 to see that new round of OPEC cuts start to take place and really to start balancing the market. So that, that tallest column is not as bad as it could have been, but it was not good, right? So every day it's above the axis. It means we have to put that extra crude in storage because we're not able to use it. Now, fast forward to the future, Q3 today, that, that bar is under the axis, which means we're undersupplied, which means we are pulling crude out of stocks. And we expect next quarter that will ramp up, we'll pull even more crude out of stocks and then through next year. And so that's what's gonna enable this market to rebalance for us to reach equilibrium and see a higher price over time. But it also means it's gonna take that long. So don't expect a 50 or $60 price tomorrow. It's gonna take some time to work off those stocks. We're in the early innings. We're maybe we're in Q2 or we're in the second inning of a, of a, of a ball game, right? We are, we've started that trend. We're up around the forties. Um, you're seeing that price move around, but certainly it's better than it was, but we still have a long way to go before the market's really, really in equilibrium. Our next slide. Now this is where I show you a little bit of information on OPEC. It's a lot of numbers. You're, I don't want you to read through all of them, but I highlighted and circled in red on the bottom, that whole row. So what happened? We had the price war with Saudi Arabia and Russia. Right? Then they came back to the table. They negotiated a new round of cuts. Those cuts they negotiated were significant. So when you think of May, June, they cut, agreed to cut 9.7 million barrels out. And then Saudi Arabia and others came out and even cut more on top of that. The July cut, they extended. So originally it was just supposed to be May, June. Then the, the demand was still not where it needed to be. So they've been very intentionally managing supply. They extended those big cuts through July. They came together, they met a couple weeks ago. They decided not to do another extension through August. So August, that circled number, 7.7 .7 million barrels in red. That's what you, you should expect to see, that level of cuts from OPEC starting August through the, the end of the year. So that means you are gonna see some of that production from them trickle back in, and they're not gonna be at those giant cuts that they were at for a period of time. Now, that being said, we built that into the last slide. So we're taking that into account when we tell you how many stocks we work through. And that's part of the reason it does take some time for that to, to unfold. Now this is showing compliance, because one of the big questions we get all the time is, it's great that OPEC made cuts, but are they being, or they agreed to make cuts, but did they actually do it? Are they being compliant with what they agreed to? If you just look at the chart here that's on the right, you can see the last data point, it's a little bit covered, but it's 107% of compliance, which means they're either above compliance because they cut out that extra crude. So that's a good thing. You can also see history back just through, through mid last year, recently before the price war, and even before that, back to 2016, OPEC has had very high levels of compliance. Now this is different than what's happened in previous decades where it was a different picture, but but these countries have been very compliant in recent time, and we would expect this to continue. So we use those cuts as our go forward assumption because they have been so compliant. If we go to the next one, then now we start talking about US. So US supply, uh, you've seen a lot of shut in news, you saw prices go very negative. It's been a chaotic time and it's definitely hit US supply. So this supply chart shows you history, then that green dotted line dip, that's showing you our estimate of shut ins that happened. Um, May, June timeframe. We've seen a lot of that come back. So we've seen a lot of those shut-ins come back, but we're still on a downward trajectory, right? There's 280 rigs running, very few new wells coming online. Uh, aside from the shut-ins that have now come back, we're pretty much in natural decline in most basins around the country. So that means we're going to see some, some additional drops. We're expecting crude to continue to fall until early to mid next year, and then you'll see it start to track up. So that's that solid green line you see going forward. We also showed you some scenarios here around what else could production do if different price scenarios unfold. 
and that's it's really just meant to put put a range around what price would mean falling supply which is really 30 and under 40 you fall and then you flatten out 50 you're very slightly growing and ours is our, our forecast the green is growing faster so that also implies we are expecting higher pricing than 50 in the outer years it's not going to be quick but you, we will get there the next slide we'll talk through this is refined products and so one of the things i like to mention with crude markets is right now everyone's trying to predict when is this demand actually going to come back and what should you be watching for to see that refiners are going to start ramping up that you're going to see more buyers out there for crude which will help support a higher crude price now that really happens if the refined product markets are healthy so if, if refiners are able to sell gasoline and jet fuel right that's the trickiest one right now fuel oils all these things that come out of a barrel of crude that's really important so we track these products really closely because this is is really the leading indicator of what will happen with crude pricing and crude buyers showing up or not gasoline that first chart on the upper left that one's come back significantly from where it was when everybody was first staying home but it's not recovered yet right it's we're not back up to previous levels and we expect it's going to take more time the jet fuel on the top in the middle, jet fuel fell off a cliff, it, it plateaued, but it really hasn't recovered. And that's going to take a lot longer to recover. So that's a big chunk of demand that we're just not going to get back quickly. And then the others, you can see they're generally tracking better. But as a percentage of the barrel, it's gasoline, jet fuel, um, and the other diesels that really make up the bulk of it. So that, that's really what matters. Our next slide. Now this is speaking to refiner margins. So we would tell you that refiner margins are terrible, right? So this chart on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left, is showing you by pad, and for certain um, grades of crude, what that crack margin or that frat, uh, crack margin looks like. So if you're a refiner, you want to take cheap crude, you want to upgrade it into high value products, and that's how you make your money. If you're not able to sell those products, the price comes down, and now all of a sudden you're flat and there's no margin, and that's really what you're seeing here. There's very little refining margin anywhere for any type of crude. Pad two, that kind of darker greenish line, was looking a little better. And when I looked at this this week, it actually came back down. So this is a very effective price ceiling on crude price recovery, which is why we would tell you expect to stay around here in the 40s until later this year and into even next year. All right, our next slide. So what does that mean for price? So this is what we would, what our forecast is. So what are we predicting? We're basically saying um, we should hover around here. We should hover in this, this 35 to 45, $40 range. Then next year, 2021, you do start to see it tick up. We can hit 50, 55 by the end of, of 2021. And then a longer term kind of plateau, you'll see around 55 for most of 2022 and 2023. And then it bumps up to about 60, which would be a, a truer equilibrium in the late 2023, 2024 timeframe. And so this is, again, us taking all those supply demand factors into play, and this is what we would predict. Now, the next two slides, we talked a lot about crude. This next one, I wanted to say a little bit about gas before we hand it off. This is crude, uh, or this is gas, this is LNG exports. LNG exports took a big hit for gas. Gas wasn't impacted as much initially, but then that, that hit came later with the demand destruction. It's not, it's not great news. We're, we're down less than half of the LNG exports we were at before, but we are expecting quicker recovery on the gas side than the crude side. So something to look forward to. And then finally, our gas forecast slide. Um, we're basically predicting low prices through the most of the rest of this year, a little bit of a bump in December when winter shows up. Next year, a much higher gas price, actually, because we're not drilling as much for crude, so we're not getting associated gas. So you're going to need a higher gas price to get gas drillers going again, because the gas demand is not as bad as crude demand. And then it settles back down to that $3 mark. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, that's really what we're expecting over the next several years for both crude and for natural gas markets. Bernadette, thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite Eric Stevens to give a little bit of what they're seeing from the Netherlands tool perspective on uh, current price environment. And he'll give a little bit of a, a discussion on, on activity levels and certainly the impacts to reserves. So I'll pass the mic over to Eric. Thanks, Aaron. Um, thanks, Bernadette, for the, the great background on market conditions. I think for those of us in the industry, we, we hope that uh, the, the price rebound that we were forecasting there is, is real. Uh, go, into the, go to the next slide, Aaron. Um, you know, it'd be tough to have a conversation like this without talking a little bit about rig counts. Uh, so that's the first slide here. You can see the inset graph there that shows rig counts over the last 15 years. 
Um, you can see that you know we're tremendously down. You know, currently we're about 75% down year on year in oil rigs, 60% down on rigs drilling for gas. Um, you know, that that's uh, that's considerably lower than it's been in a long time, and 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 where we do still see activity, you know, that's pretty much concentrated in the Permian, the Haynesville, and the Marcellus Utica. Those those three plays make up about 75% of the ongoing activity in the U.S. You know, as Bernadette mentioned, you know, this is a result of, of low commodity prices, um, you know, supply demand imbalance, and a number of you know, macro conditions that she's modeled. Uh, Aaron, go to the next slide. So this slide is intended to show, you know, kind of give that, give a perspective here of kind of where we are. Um, on, the, on the right there, you'll see the historical WTI spot price with the, the SEC price, those are the horizontal bars for the last four years. And you can see that at year in 19, we ended the year with an SEC price of around $56 a barrel. Uh, by mid-year, that price had dropped about $8 to $48 a barrel. And then depending on your view of the last five months of the year, August to December, we're looking at an SEC price probably somewhere between $37 and $42 a barrel. You know, those, those types of you know, pricing impacts will have impacts on, on things as it, come, as, a, as it relates to reserve reporting, you know, things like development timing. Uh, it's obviously causing folks to go back and rethink operating expense, capital expense, where can they make cuts. So every company that, that we talk to has their own view of pricing. You know, you look to those that do a lot of the macro modeling, but you know, everyone has their own view of what they think prices are going to do. Uh, and, and there's also been an ongoing discussion about well spacing we'll talk about here in a minute. These things also have a, have a tremendous impact on, on the borrowing base. You know, what a company can continue to, to use uh, capital-wise in, in, in their ongoing operations. Um, you know, we're hearing, you know, a number of our, our clients and a number of companies out there talking in their press releases about, you know, kind of a lower for longer environment. Uh, obviously, the discussion about working within cash flow has been kind of the hot topic for a long, a long while. You know, no longer are we talking about growth at the expense of negative cash flow. You know, those things are going to stick around for a while, and that, that does have an impact on things like, you know, development timing. You know, when you talk about a, a, a public company that has to drill, you know, their PUDs within five years, you know, rigs dropping to 25% of what they were a year ago, that's going to have an impact on, on how quickly they're able to, to convert their inventory to PDP. And so you are going to see reduced PUD counts. Uh, I guess one of the things that's, that's somewhat beneficial, you know, five years ago, the SEC was chasing a number of companies on the five-year rule and, and asking questions about, you know, tell me how it is that you know these are reasonably certain. And so that we saw a number of clients take a little bit more conservative approach, maybe only carry a one or two-year PUD program in their approved category. And, and so, you know, with lower prices, as long as those wells are still economic, they have some flexibility to space those out. But again, that, that, that kind of, there's it, all, of these, all these factors come into play. You know, what do you think pricing is going to do? How is that going to impact, you know, your rig count? You know, if you were an operator a year ago with 10 rigs running and now you've got two rigs running or three rigs running, you know, what's your view for the rest of the year? What's your view for next year? And, and, and building back up to 10 rigs to be able to, to convert your PUDs to, to PDPs. Um, you know, so that's, that's, uh, that's going to have an impact. You know, operating expense, capital expense, we, we've seen, uh, as the numbers are coming in through a lot of the, the mid-year reports that we've done, we've seen the companies have been able to reduce operating expense. Uh, some of that is due to just, you know, wells that were being shut in, production going offline. So the, the analysis on that is, you know, how much of that is, is can be sustained if, as wells are brought back online and as production comes back up to previous levels. You know, will operating expense also come back to previous levels or are there actually some, some OPEX reductions that can be carried forward? One of the nice things about the SEC definitions is it allows you, I mean, it's very prescriptive about how it defines pricing, but it, it allows you to use uh, operating expense, you know, on the day of the report. So to the extent that those operating expenses are real and ongoing, you know, a company can take that into account in their, in their documents and in their report. Um, as far as CapEx goes, I mean, similarly, you know, companies are looking at their, their, their CapEx uh, estimates looking to see if there's ways to reduce capital expenditures again trying to stay within these revised economic uh, conditions that we find ourselves in um, and then the develop development spacing we'll talk about a little bit on the next slide you know, again this this all of this kind of stews into the borrowing base and that that is going to have a tremendous impact on on a company going forward you know the the spring uh, borrowing base calculations some of this has already kind of been working through 
those companies that found themselves in a tough situation have six months to kind of work through that. I expect that, you know, as we get into the fall, they'll, they'll continue to have some difficulties and in, in, into the year end. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, Aaron. So this, this slide here, just as a, a, a little discussion about well spacing, you know, we were seeing discussions about well spacing, up spacing, you know, even before this, the, the pandemic. Uh, you know, operators in late 18 and through 19 were talking about upspacing. Uh, you know, with, with prices being low, we expect this to kind of be the new norm. Uh, you can see in the chart up above, you know, this is from the Permian. You know, you can see that, you know, once you get to a certain number of wells per section, you start seeing interference. Uh, you know, companies are, are looking at, at that interference and, and trying to optimize the economics as best they can. Uh, you know, the, the benefit of upspacing is, you know, you get you get uh, maybe GORs in an oil play, GORs rise a little bit slower, that's, that's helpful. Uh, and really what, you, what companies are doing now is they're looking to, to, to minimize the inter interference only or only tolerate the interference to the extent that they're able to capture incremental hydro hydrocarbons in a profitable way. So you, you, I think we're gonna see much more of the discussion around four to six wells per section versus you know, some of the higher numbers that were being tested out uh, in prior years. Um, go to the, uh, the next slide, Aaron. <clears throat> I also wanted to just throw in just a, a slide in here to talk about fair market value or value, you know, how, how assets are valued. You know, we're gonna get into it in a few minutes with, with Jeff uh, and Joe about bankruptcies and accounting and you know, an asset ha you know, has a number of different values. It has a fair market value. It can have a book value that's different. It can have a liquidation value. And so one of the things is you're coming in and valuing assets and looking at acquiring, you know, the fair market value is what a willing buyer will pay a willing seller. That's something to always remember. And that's when there's a reasonable amount of time to sell the asset. And, you know, you see the definition down there at the bottom and, you know, both parties have access to all the facts. And so, you know, that may, you know, a fair market value may not be what's in play necessarily, uh, you know, this year or next year, but that, you know, what we put on this slide is an, an, a kind of a general practice. This on the on the right. This is this comes from the SPW uh, survey that they do annually about parameters used that, that the industry is using when they're evaluating or valuing assets. And so you can see by reserve category a risk factor that's applied to the discounted cash flow for the, the volumes that happen to be in those reserve categories. And and you know using that methodology you can get to a value uh, that, that maybe you you might use in, in in going to make an offer for an asset. You know, there are a number of other conditions that come into play uh, in determining that value. And those are listed here, I guess, for your future reading. But, you know, if, if it fits into a, to a client's uh, property set well, or if they want to get more oily, and this is, it's oily, you know, there's a number of things that, that might also add additional value to an asset uh, as you're looking at valuing uh, properties. Um, just, I guess, I just one anecdotal note that, you know, we are hearing a lot of people say that, you know, assets are selling for PV, you know, PDP, PV15, PV20. Uh, it's not real certain if that's just the difference in, in view of the assets between the buyer and seller, if it's, it really is a real increase. Um, we're also hearing a lot of uh, discussion around not giving much value for, for PUDs unless they have, uh, you know, rate of return over 20%. Uh, the difficulty is there haven't been a, a lot of transactions in which to, to, to break that apart and, and see what's, what's happening on a, on a more statistical basis. But, but one thing we do see is that, you know, banks are getting more conservative, you know, th things are, are swinging back the, the conservative route of, of, of what is an asset uh, value, uh, really. Uh, next slide. Um, if, if you're interested, uh, the, um, we do a seminar, you know, five times a year. We talk about property, uh, property evaluations, uh, kind of the, the full methodology They're located kind of throughout the world. Uh, I'm guessing that the, more, the, the ones that are coming up more uh, soon will, will be over uh, video conference. But, uh, you know, in, I guess in summary, you know, we're going to see PUDs go down this year. Uh, and while that's not great for the industry necessarily, one of the, thing, one of the benefits or one of the silver linings, if there is a silver lining, is that it's giving operators a chance to really uh, review the data, evaluate the, the, the interference, optimize the well placement, optimize the well spacing, and, and try and optimize the, the capital that they are deploying. Uh, you know, the impact will be lower PUDs, but hopefully the, the uncertainty or you know, the, the confidence level of the performance of those PUDs will, will be more certain. Um, 
and that's what I have. So uh, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Hey, Eric, thanks for thanks for those uh, talking points. I think that you hit on a lot of things, and I want to come back to some of those things and in, in questions. And we are getting a few questions coming in. Remind folks, feel free to use the Q and A uh, session and, and ping those in. I'd like to turn the call over to to Jeff Nichols, partner with uh, Haynes and Boone, to discuss current legal issues. I'm sure we'll talk about some bankruptcy things, but also some opportunities that are out there. Uh, so I welcome Jeff. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, thanks to the rest of the crew. It's always interesting to see people from different disciplines look at the same market, the same problems, and how it uh, impacts all, all of our different uh, uh, aspects that we look at in the oil and gas market. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, Okay, I, I thought I would start off with the uh, problems and um, I would turn to some of our reports, which we show on the next slide. Um, we, uh, we have a large oil and gas group and a large uh, bankruptcy group. So I like to say we know how to roll with the punches. And um, in, in collaboration with our clients, we put out a lot of different reports. Our borrowing based redetermination survey is one of our more popular ones. Um, and uh, Eric referred to the, to the fall uh, redetermination season. In the spring, uh, we found that largely uh, uh, banks were reluctant to dramatically drop uh, their borrowing basis. But the fall may be another story altogether. So we we'll look forward to um, getting our input from our clients on that. Um, but right now, the popular one is by far is the oil patch bankruptcy monitor, which is shown on the next slide. Um, we analyze every oil and gas uh, bankruptcy filing and look at it for um, who's doing what, the kind of debt, where the filing is. This is just one of the um, graphics, but it kind of shows a lot. It shows the total dollar amount of the bankruptcies uh, from 2015 through last year. And you can see already that 2020 is, uh, looks like it's gonna be a record year um, if you just take the first half and, and double it. But nobody expects the second half to be the same as the first half. Everyone uh, generally thinks that a lot of these filings are, a lot of these companies are getting ready to file. And largely the companies listed here um, their seeds were sown uh, late last year. They were already kind of headed towards restructuring. Uh, but some of the more recent ones were probably pushed in because of the uh, because of recent events and the price drops. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, what I thought I would do is just examine the first day filings. Uh, I picked nine of the biggest uh, bankruptcies um, and take a look at uh, this as just a glimpse of what we may be in store for. Um, there's a lot of different estimates of how many companies will file, but I, I keep hearing around 100 or so may file. So um, I thought this would be a good glimpse into uh, what we'll see in the future. And if you look at them, the, the repeating theme is that debt is being equitized. Debt is not getting out on scale. Um, and uh, like Southland, for example, they had a large RBL, but only 35 million of it was being rolled up. So even the RBL is being equitized. And in that case, there's a large MVC dispute, uh, which my firm is involved in, um, which may be the, the swing factor in, in how it's reorganized. Um, and then uh, Sheraton, Sheraton, the entire RBL, all the revolving term loan lenders were equitized. So um, the value there, when a uh, loan gets equitized, it's unclear what the value is that they're getting. So we largely look at that as, as kind of a loss. Um, and I guess I would say that in prior downturns, like in 2014, 2015, very few of the banks, the senior lenders uh, experienced any loss whatsoever. They largely got through, were able to roll their debt forward in the exit facility. Um, but this time it's looking a lot different. Um, whiting and extraction were the exceptions. Um, they, according to those first day filings, the RBLs are expected to be repaid in full, although the uh, junior notes uh, are gonna be equitized. If you go to the next slide, it's to show the remainder of the first day filing. Um, ultra and unit, a lot of it uh, is going to be equitized, like in unit, uh, only a, or in unit, it was kind of unclear from filings, but it looks like some of the RBL will be rolled up into an exit facility. In Gavilan, there's a sales process, uh, which makes it unclear what the recovery will be for the senior lenders, depending on whether they credit bid or not. And then in Sable and Chesapeake, um, Sable, a lot of the RBL will be equitized, only 75 million of the 574. Um, will be uh, rolled up. <clears throat> and in Chesapeake is also um, a good story for the RBL lenders. because according to your first day filings, they will uh, roll into an exit facility. <clears throat> so the next slide shows the summary. Um, 
And um, just quickly, it looks like uh, eight out of the nine uh, filings will have some type of debt equitized. <clears throat> Gavilan, it wasn't clear from the first day filings, but they may end up equitizing some of the debt. And it looks like either four out of the five of the nine will end up with RBL lenders owning part or all of the oil and gas companies. And that's really unusual. It's not really since the 80s that banks, uh, as these RBL lenders, um, took over the oil and gas companies. In the 80s, it was unique because there was a savings and loan crisis at the same time that there was an oil crisis. Um, so the, we really are in unique times. Um, and only three of the nine, it looks like the RBL is going to get through uh, intact. Which brings up an interesting legal question, which is the prospect of banks owning oil and gas companies. And there's a regulation uh, limiting that. Banks aren't really supposed to be owning oil and gas companies. Uh, the regulation we refer to as Oreo, uh, which refers to other real estate owned uh, property. And the regulations were recently updated last year. And in general, um, the Oreo should be disposed of at the earliest time that prudent judgment dictates. Um, it doesn't require immediate disposal, but it doesn't permit the bank to hold on to the property speculatively. So these banks that will own these companies will be under a certain amount of pressure to dispose of them quickly. There is a five year maximum period which could be extended, but I think people expect that the banks will need to dispose of this property much sooner than the five year period. So I thought I'd turn now to opportunities on the next slide. Going one more slide, please. Um, one of the opportunities that a lot of our clients are talking about is the Main Street Lending Program. Uh, the Main Street New Loan Facility uh, offers some degree of hope for oil and gas companies. Um, I won't go through this chart. Uh, I think you know we'll make this available to people who ask for it. Um, but of these three facilities, the Main Street Loan one is is the only one that our banking clients are considering. And the reason is because they don't have to share collateral. If you go to the next slide, it shows collateral uh, and use of proceeds. Next. There we go. Um, for the uh, Main Street new loan facility, it can be secured or unsecured. So this uh, kind of sidecar Main Street loan can be unsecured. And so the secured lenders uh, you know, are fine with that. And it's kind of structurally subordinated, even though it, it needs to be part of the sue in terms of payment. Uh, since it's unsecured, they feel better about it. The expanded loan facility can be secured or unsecured, but they need to be kind of part of the sue in terms of collateral with the lender. So lenders aren't really interested in that. And then the Main Street priority loan facility uh, is uh, gets priority. So lenders, existing lenders, these oil companies really don't like exploring that. Um, the other thing I'd mention that's kind of a problem is the use of proceeds. Um, it cannot be used to refinance existing debt. So a lot of these credit facilities right now have kind of a cash either directly through a financial covenant or indirectly through um, an anti-cash hoarding provision. And uh, so a lot of the banks take the position of, you know, why don't we just pay ourselves down now rather than doing the cash sweep? And the answer is the loan cannot be used to refinance existing loans. So the company can use it to pay for pro for expenses which will increase the cash sweep down the road, uh, but they can't pay themselves off net. They have to kind of wait in time for it to cycle through the system, but eventually their cash sweep will result in a, in a quicker pay down. So I thought I'd turn next to uh, some of the different structures that people are talking about. If you can go one more slide, please. Um, alternatives to RBL financing. And we've used this chart in some of our other presentations, but it's worth going over because a lot of our clients are talking about these structures uh, with us. And on the left, you show the RBL, and then we have a BPP and working interest securitization. And in a nutshell, I think most folks know what an RBL, reserve-based loan, which is uh, subject to a borrowing base secured by oil and gas properties. A VPP is a volumetric production payment, and uh, it's a conveyance of a certain volume of oil and gas assets. And the working interest securitization is a relatively new structure, which uh, uses uh, finance techniques that have been around for a while, actually. But over the past uh, 18 months or so, uh, more and more of these have emerged where they take the group of assets and drop them down to an SPV and issue bonds against them. And I'm not going to go through this whole chart again for the sake of time, but if there's a Q&A, we can revisit some of this. I just thought I'd point out three differentiating uh, issues in these different structures. The first is PUDs versus PDP. 
an RVL can secure PUDs. Uh, but as Eric mentioned, um, PUDs aren't really given any value these days. So that's one of the reasons why RVLs aren't a paper structure. Uh, and VPPs and working interest securitizations tend to only include PDPs. Um, the second differentiator is uh, the hedge. Um, in an RBL, if you go to the next slide, it shows the hedge row. Um, the, uh, sorry, maybe it's the next slide. No, previous slide. Uh, well, we'll just leave here. Oh yeah, there's the hedge and the risk profile. Um, the, uh, the hedging is quite a bit different. And for an RBL, they only hedge a portion of their production for a limited period of time, and it's on a rolling basis. For a VPP, it's a, the conveyance is a hedge included in the financing. And with a working interest securitization, really unusual, they will go to a hedge provider and do a long-term, like a five-year hedge. Um, and there's a small number of hedge providers that will actually do that deal. But that's important to securitization that a highly rated hedge provider is you know, sourcing the funds, the revenue for the structure. Um, part of the rating consideration depends on the rating of the, the hedge provider. And so finally, I would mention the financial covenants, which are a little bit different. In an RBL, there's the traditional covenants that the EBITDA, uh, you know, barring based structure. In a VPP, there are no financial covenants normally. There's a concept where it compares the tail to the total value, but basically it's, it's pretty much covenant free, which is attractive to some companies. A working interest securitization has kind of a unique covenant structure where they look at DSCR and occasionally they'll have a rapid amortization tied to uh, certain financial metrics uh, and maybe a loan to value ratio, but they're different financial covenants than an RBL would use, which may be an advantage or a disadvantage depending on your perspective. And, uh, and what they're willing to do. So I believe that is it for my presentation. So I will turn it over to Mr. Joe. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. Joe, you get to back clean up before we got some pretty good questions coming in here. So Joe, we'll kick it off with, with some of the accounting issues. Thanks, Aaron. Would you go to my disclaimer, please? Brief disclaimer, the information I'm going to express, you should not consider it advice. But the views are my own. And they're they're probably perfect, but don't rely on them. <laughs> seek seek the advice of a professional consultant if you need that. Slide, please. Tagging on to all the good information that we've heard so far, I thought I'd talk about some of the things that we feel are going to be hot topics in the accounting world for the rest of 2020. Uh, four things. And these aren't the only ones, but going concern, impairment, accounts receivable, and debt restructuring. So we'll hit each of those. Slide, please. With respect to going concern, this is no news. You know, management prepares the financial statements are required to consider whether we've got substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue in business for one year from the date the financial statements are released. So. For instance, if we're releasing a year-end set of financial statements and it takes three months, we're really thinking about 15 months from the balance sheet date. And things to think about outside of the obvious, what does the balance sheet look like on the date of the report? Uh, looking forward, thinking about cash flow modeling, what price do we use? You know, Bernadette, your comments were helpful there. Uh, it's difficult, it requires a lot of judgment, and there should be some robust consideration of why the price we're using is appropriate and the other assumptions. Got to think about the development plans. We talked about that with Eric. What are we going to spend and how flexible can we be with, with what capital we actually deploy? And thinking about availability of uh, borrowings under credit facilities, you know, if we're, if we're okay on covenants at a balance sheet date, but we think there's some risk, you got to take into account are those borrowing is really going to be available to us when we're thinking about what resources we have to, to run the company for the 15 months or so after the balance sheet date. Then the effect of commodity derivatives. You know, companies that have commodity derivatives and, and those cash flows are going to be helpful or they're going to be hurtful, those should be taken into account as we look at what resources are going to be available to the company undergoing concern considerations. Slide, please. Next, impairment. Uh, 
there were a great deal of impairments recorded in at year end 1231-2019 and, and some more in the first quarter. Uh, there may be some more in the second quarter. We'll see. Uh, but some things to think about as we're thinking about impairment, you know, full cost companies are subject to a ceiling test, very prescriptive method, just it's PV10 of the approved reserves and compare that to the carrying value and there are other adjustments to be made to both of those numbers. But one thing we gotta make sure is, is, are we really committed to funding those PUDs and can we get it done within five years? And taking that into account, is, is there an adjustment we need to make to the reserve report to get down to that PV10? Successful efforts, there's a lot more judgment involved in how you go through step one of the test, which is comparing the undiscounted future net cash flows to the carrying amount of the oil and gas properties themselves. But, you know, first thing is to figure out if there's a, if there's a trigger. It says Q1, but I meant Q2. Uh, and same question as full costs. If we've got PUDs, how committed are we? And, and you know, for a, for a successful efforts impairment test, we can use reserves beyond proved. But if we're going, if we're going to say we're not necessarily as committed to PUDs as we were, and we need to move those to probable or possible, those will have a different risk profile and maybe bear some different considerations on how much credit we give those cash flows. Uh, choosing the price, you know, successful efforts, impairment test management gets to make an assumption about what commodity prices are going to do. And, and for those people who rely on a forward price curve, forward strip, you know, that thing becomes a little bit less liquid after a couple or three years. So really thinking about and documenting management's concerns and considerations as to why they chose a price for periods outside of that strip is important. And then finally, if we do think there's an impairment, how in the world do we estimate fair value? Uh, and, and I've go back to Eric's comments too, those are really important. Uh, what value do we assign to reserves outside of, of PDP? And how do we gather data in a market that may, maybe is less liquid today than it was? Next, if you please. Accounts receivable, don't wanna to camp too much on this, but you know, to the extent companies are operators of their properties and they have joint interest billings receivable, I think it's it's a good idea to start monitoring how collectible those things are. And sure, if we don't get paid, we can seek other remedies, you know, maybe netting revenue and so forth, or or trying to get that working interest back for ourselves. But when you're thinking about that, yeah, we can net against revenue, but we got to take a look at what those revenues are going to be, and will it be enough to absorb that that jib that we're having trouble collecting? Next. And debt restructuring, uh, starting to see these pop up more frequently, but this is a really difficult and complicated area of gap that requires a lot of careful consideration. Uh, is it a troubled debt restructuring? First of all, is the company in financial distress? Second of all, did the bank actually grant a concession as they're de defined by gap? Those are difficult. They require a, a little bit of modeling and some present value techniques to be applied and running through there. Then borrowing base redeterminations, we've talked about that a little bit already. So what, what happens if we get a redetermined borrowing base and it's less than the amount outstanding? Well, obviously a portion of that at least is going to be classified as a current liability on the balance sheet. But there are other considerations if, uh, you know, if we're in compliance with covenants at a balance sheet date, but it's likely that we'll fall out of compliance going forward, then there's disclosures to be considered. If we fail a covenant at a balance sheet date and we get a waiver from the lender, we also have to think about how are we going to do with respect to that covenant the next time we have to measure it. And if the next time we have to measure compliance with that covenant is within a year, we have to demonstrate that it's probable we'll be in, in compliance in order to not reclassify that debt as, as current. So those things are important for the, the consideration of the balance sheet and the footnote disclosures, but also should come into play in our going concern considerations. So with that happy news, I think we can go to questions and answers. 
All right. Thank you, each of you, for, for all of your comments. I did want to, I'll, I'll unshare the screen here, but take note of, of the individuals here and their uh, email addresses. If specific slides you are looking for, please feel free to reach out to each of those individuals uh, after this event. Uh, there will be a replay available as well. Uh, but let's dive into some Q&A. So Bernadette, I want to bring in uh, you here. We got a question, you know, we've heard a lot about price being important across everything we're doing, certainly supply and demand. You showed a slide where uh, driving and driving demand was, was coming back, but there's also, I think, a, a general belief out there because we're not traveling on airplanes, maybe we're driving more for our summer vacations. Is this one of those things as we end the summer driving season where there may be a, a larger hole in demand to come? Yeah, so it's a great point that that uh, summer driving season is peak gasoline demand in the U.S., right? So that's true. So we're right in the thick of that right now. If you look at that chart, though, we're not quite up at where we should be for this time of year, right? We're still trending a little bit low, but we have seen people start moving around. Many of you probably know folks that are opting to take like an RV trip instead of fly on an airplane somewhere. And so that is, that's consistent with what we're seeing actually around the world, too. So we're about, we're a few weeks later than other countries when they started thinking about like the relax, relaxing of restrictions and folks moving around. We track road congestion data all over the world and we actually do see at this point in China, many of those areas that were hard hit, their road congestion is now actually stronger than it was pre-pandemic. So it is true that you do see the gasoline respond first, you see the air travel lag, and that's consistent with what we saw with SARS um, historically. It's also consistent with what we know about air travel. Air travel will take a while to recover. And it's really because think 9-11, 9-11 impacted primarily US travel. People just weren't comfortable flying yet. It took three years for the industry to recover from that. And now we have that at a global scale. So this is not gonna be a quick, a quick fix for air travel in particular, um, but you should, we do expect and you should expect for the gasoline piece, we are in the peak period now, it's gonna get worse again. If you look at the storage number that came out yesterday, we're even starting to see it now. Right, so we did see a big crude draw and that, that kind of caught the headlines, but you saw big um, injections into storage builds for gasoline and finished distillate products. So that's not great news, right? And so that's some of why you see price, price pressure today. Well, thanks for that. And I think, you know, as we see, and you mentioned in your comments, you know, we're in, we're in early innings here. And certainly that touches everyone's topic here that, that maybe we are in for a little bit lower for longer pricing. This $40 environment is going to be there. HUDs may be rolling off. Eric, as you guys do your work and you're closer maybe to where we're at this economic threshold of, of what's economic and what's not, uh, this $40 to $50 range and, and PUDs going off the books doesn't mean the reserves go away. What do you guys see? Is, is, there, is there more leeway here at $40 or... It, at sixty dollars, when we're changing, is there is there uh, what price implications? I guess uh, have on those puds. Yeah, good. I mean, good question. You know, the, obviously, you know, not not having the capital to drill the puds <laughs> creates a problem. So, you know, to the extent that the the capital is not there, you know, the, the pud puds are going to drop. Um, you know, for those that are still drilling, you know, there's still a, a great argument to be made that the wells are being drilled economically, even at, the, at this $40 a barrel price. You know, we still have 200, and I think as of last Friday, 251 rigs running in the U.S. Uh, so, and, and by and large, those are, you know, that's, that's spread across a lot of operators, uh, you know, retaining one and two or three, you know, four rigs. Just There's only a few that are out there with you know, multiples of, of rigs. Um, but, you know, there are wells that are still out there, you know, that are economic, you know, in particular gas can, continues uh, for some of the big wells in the Marcellus, Utica, Haynesville, you know, very large volume wells. Those still make sense at the prices we're talking about today. Um, but yeah, I mean, 60 versus 40, that makes a big difference. Um, and, and I think, I mean, for the, and the, obviously the publics and the, and the privates are going to view things a little bit differently. They're going to have different reporting requirements. Um, so, I mean, I, it's, it's kind of a complicated question. I don't know if you have, you want to go into a little more detail of specifically what you're asking. Uh, so I, one of the direct questions, and I don't know if you have an answer on this is, is, you know, if SEC pricing in, in 2020 comes in at $40 per barrel, 
what decrease of PDP reserves would you expect on average for a company? Gotcha. And, yeah, I mean, that, and that's a very com that's also a very complicated uh, question to answer. But you know, the the volume itself for in the PDP category is is probably less at risk than the PUD volume. Uh, you know, PDP a lot of a lot of these a lot of these wells they come on at very steep declines, but they 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 transition to a very low declines or lower declines, and so you know the economic limit may not, you know, you're going to have an economic limit that's sooner in time, which will cut off a little bit of the tail in those PDP volumes, but the volumes itself probably won't change uh, much, much, much at all, maybe 5, 10, 15 percent. I mean, the issue is going to be more on the value side, the, the, the marginal dollars from 40 to 50, uh, in a, an oil price from 40 to 50 dollars, that's, that's, that's a lot of uh, value that's, that's being destroyed, and, and that can be tremendous, and that's where you've got companies looking at operating expense, capital expense, what can I change? How can I change the way I'm operating to, to, okay, I'm working in a lower price environment, can I also operate in a lower cost per barrel environment as well? I think that's helpful. And, and so as we think about this, this access to capital and, and, and certainly the, the reserves are in there, Jeff, I wanna bump over to you and, and, and think a little bit about the RBL lenders. You guys have, obviously have your survey uh, but we got a question in here talking about, you know, what can the RBL lender be asking of their uh, potential company, whether it be around GNA, hey, I need you to reduce costs, or or other other things for consideration. Or are they just looking at, look, here's the value of the PDP reserves. So are there are there other asks that are coming in from the the RBL groups? Right. I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a. Uh tightening down on a lot of different aspects of these companies. Uh, GNA is a, is a uh, focal point of a lot of the discussions. Uh, so they're tightening up covenants uh, regarding GNA. Sometimes they don't have a covenant, so they put in place a GNA cap. Um, and a lot of these uh, lenders and, and owners are talking about smash codes where they combine two companies uh, to one with one management team uh, with, a, with an eye towards uh, saving GNA. And a lot of them are implementing barring based reductions, automatic barring based reductions. So if, if they would have done a $50 million uh, uh, barring based reduction and that would you know, create a $25 million deficiency, they, uh, they're putting in place provisions where they only reduce it $5 million a month or something like that to let the, bar, let the borrower uh, slowly kind of catch up because they know the borrower can't pay that and they don't want to throw the borrower into uh, uh, bankruptcy. Um, there's a lot of discussion around anti-cash hoarding provisions as well to ensure that they're not caught kind of like they were in past downturns where they drew down the entire facility right before they filed bankruptcy. Uh, so there's a lot of things in play. Uh, usually these companies are also talking about asset sales and other potential deals and um, kind of trying to buy time with their lenders while they work out some of these other arrangements. Absolutely. And I want to I want to jump on to maybe a little bit of the, the question of M&A. And, and certainly we saw the, the Noble deal. Uh, we got questions at, at Entercom about, you know, is this the start of, of the next M&A? You guys, uh, Eric and Joe, you both talked about fair market value. Jeff, we've got 363 sales that may be a potential out of, out of this. We'd be interested in your guys' perspective on where does the, the industry go on consolidation and M&A? And is that also something where it's expected that we've had it but is that going to take a little bit of time? And and Joe, maybe I'll I'll bring you in here to to give the first word. So we've seen a lot of deals try to get done, and and we're involved with several management teams who have capital to deploy and want to go out and find deals. But the small view that I've seen, it's been still very difficult to get the bid and the ask to reconcile. And so while well, I personally believe there's a significant opportunity for M&A deals to go. Uh, companies that need to focus on a given area and release non-core assets should be able to do so. Uh, I'm not seeing it happen yet in my small piece of the world. And how about you, Eric, on, on the reserve side, how is that uh, coming together? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with, with Joe and, you know, We've been talking about M&A for a while. We keep expecting we're going to see consolidation, and uh, there's just been a, you know, very few deals so far. I think it's going to get pushed to a, to a tipping point here very quickly, and you know, the, the difficulty of sellers and buyers finding 
common ground <clears throat> is going to come to a tipping point at some point. You just can't you can't delay it any further, and so you're going to have to concede uh, to some degree. So I think I think maybe we're we're seeing you know with these this, these recent deals, maybe this is the start of, of many more to come uh, later this year, and then starting into into next. And Jeff, maybe you can touch on as we see companies maybe coming into emergence or closer to a 363 sale. We've seen some of those so far. Uh, how are those exiting, and and what do the valuations look like on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, and many of these uh, bankruptcies, the, the creditors will end up owning the company. They're, they're going to run a sales process, but they may not like what they see. And so they may end up just being equitized and owning the properties. But that really will just delay the M&A process because lenders don't like to own uh, oil and gas companies. So sooner or later, they're going to it's going to result in some type of merger or combination uh, down the road. Uh, some of the early filings like Alta Mesa and Sanchez you know, didn't go well because of the price drop and uh, people you know, are a little bit fearful that there's going to be another lockdown and maybe another price drop. So if they get into an M&A deal, it may, uh, it may become difficult if there's another drastic price drop. Um, so I could foresee many of the uh, creditors ending up owning these companies and then a few months, six months to a year down the road end up uh, with the transaction where the assets change hands in some type of consolidated entity. It's certainly a huge opportunity for the big oil and gas companies that have good financing um, and are credit worthy to snatch up a lot of uh, uh, properties uh, inexpensively. And, and so Bernadette, on shifting gears just a little bit, obviously the consolidation is, will play into this, but if you guys in your work, and, and Eric, you may be able to weigh in on this as well, identified different plays or basins or formations that may, may be at more risk of not returning to a, a, a new normal, if you will, of activity levels um, as you're going through your analysis? Sure. So I think it's interesting because you see sweet spots in every major play in the country, right? So as rigs recover, we would certainly expect rigs to come back everywhere. Um, as many come back, that gets pretty tricky when you're geographically farther away from the market. And especially when you have a lot more pressure on pipelines, even the Northeast, right? With ACP being canceled, with the, with the challenges with DAPL right now, with the recent ruling in Oklahoma on the east side and for reservation land, what that might be, what that might mean for infrastructure. I think where I go to is the risk that activity won't return is, is pretty heavily dependent on infrastructure. And there's a lot of risk now that there maybe wasn't even a several weeks ago. So that, that for us is top of mind. I think that also comes into play when you think about risk for like a new administration, what that could look like. Infrastructure is still, is, it's challenging, right? It's challenging today. It doesn't get any easier. So um, geographically far from the market. So think of things like the Balkan, maybe the Rockies. The farther you are, the more expensive it is to transport your commodity, which means you have to have a higher price to be able to, to, to get that rate of return. And it just gets harder when you're far away. Canada, that's tricky, so. She stole my answer. Like all I can say is ditto. That's exactly what I was gonna say. You know, when you get further away from the market, that's exactly, you know, those are the areas that, in, in, in some of those instances, you have additional political concerns that you have to worry about. You know, Colorado, uh, you know, she mentioned, you know, Williston, that's just, it's just far away. You got, you know, that, those are the ones that are going to be more, more difficult. And you see, you know, in today's rig count where rigs are still running, you know, those have sw slow, those have small rig counts, whereas the Permian, Haynesville, you know, those are, those are still running. They're still running lower than where they were a year ago, for sure. But I still see activity there. Well, thank you for that. And we're, we're coming up here on the top of the hour. So I, I will give everyone kind of a last go around here to, to maybe highlight the one thing that, that folks need to be thinking about here for the remainder of 2020. And I'll just go with who I see first on the screen. Uh, Jeff, do you want to chime in? Yeah, the one thing I uh, would add is the prospect for natural gas to uh, really lead the way out of this. Uh, a lot of LNG uh, uh, concern and focus these days around the world, and um, natural gas hasn't taken nearly the hit that oil has. Bernadette? Uh, I would point to volatility. Right? When we talk about pricing, we tend to say maybe it'll be $40 or right around there, but we're expecting a lot of volatility around there. I mean, we're, we're, I think, down a dollar today on some, on some news. 
right? But that's, that's the world that we're in now. Until you get to equilibrium, it is a lot of volatility. So be prepared for that. If we drop into the 30s, that's not a shock to me, right? If we bump up a little bit and come back down, that wouldn't be a shock. So we, we're certainly expecting to stay right around here, but it's gonna be still a wild ride. All right, Joe. You know, more or less same comments as Bernadette and Jeff. Um, being aware of the risks and making sure those are being managed. That's probably my main advice. <laughs> Spoken like a true accountant. Eric? Yeah, I mean, in a similar vein, I would say that, you know, take take the silver lining where it is and and, and, and take this time to, to try and understand, you know, reduce the uncertainty the best we can. You know, I think well spacing is going to be very important going into the future. Um, I think gas also, you know, this, this, uh, this it, it'll be interesting to see how this, how this plays out. Um, but yeah, I think this is a time, we've got a little bit of time to, to dig in. We're, we're working, we're not running, chasing 20, 30 rigs, chasing just a few. Let's try and figure out the best technical, technical solution to deploy the capital we do have in the best possible manner. Well, we'll leave it there. Uh, I wanna thank all of you guys for, for joining us today and for your insights and your time and preparation for putting uh, this together. I uh, would also uh, be remiss if I didn't do a little shameless plug for Entercom's the Oil and Gas Conference coming up August 17th through 19th. All of these fine folks have been long-term partners of Entercom as well as sponsors of the event. Uh, we're really looking forward to diving in as, as Eric just mentioned. We're gonna take some time to dive in ourselves uh, with more of the market fundamentals. We'll hear from management teams. We've got uh, you know, e &I from a, a national oil company on through to folks that are looking to raise a round capital. And so I think it'll be a uh, tremendous time for the en energy industry to get together. We are gonna be virtual this year, but we hope you can join us. So uh, go sign up, register and, and continue this dialogue. Uh, lastly, replay of this event will be on Inveris's website. Uh, we will also have it a part of Entercom's on-demand section of the uh, conference. And again, please reach out to any of the individuals on this panel uh, with more questions as well as uh, for their slides if, if that is something of interest. So with that, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, guys.